Well, welcome everybody. Uh, it's hard to believe it's January 2021. And this is our first Islington Reads of the Year. And we're looking forward to a number coming up in, the, in this uh, upcoming year. Anyway, tonight is a very special night. Uh, we have one of our own homegrown talent authors from Toronto, born and bred in Toronto, Rachel McMillan. And she is an absolute bibliophile. She's a historical nut. Uh, and does all sorts of amazing historical uh, research. Um, she is the author of numerous books. I actually met Rachel when she came to do an event at the bookstore when we could have people in the bookstore. And that was back in 2018, where she had just uh, um, released her new book called Murder at the Flamingo. And there's a, been a follow-up to that book as well called uh, Murder in the City of Liberty, if I remember correctly. Anyway, a fabulous series. Rachel is an amazing author. And like I said, she's homegrown talent. Um, so it's always nice to be able to support our, uh, our local Toronto authors. Um, Rachel graduated from Ryerson University. And as I said, she's been passionate about her books, all about books all her life. Um, she now works for a literary agency and she's a literary agent. Uh, she helps fellow authors and aspiring writers. Um, she's also a book influencer. So she's very um, active on social media. So if you don't um, if you are on social media, it would be great to follow Rachel on social media because she's always unveiling wonderful, wonderful books that uh, would be of interest to, to many people. And I can tell you, there have been a number of books that she's um, she sort of promoted on social media and I haven't heard about from the publishers and I've gone and researched them. And as a result of, uh, of Rachel's recommendation, I've ended up ordering some for the store. So there you go, Rachel, you're uh, as a book influencer, it uh, definitely works. It's paying off for me as a, as a bookstore owner. Um, anyway, Rachel, um, like I said, she's extremely enthusiastic. She's written some fabulous, fabulous books. And one of them we are going to hear about tonight. And uh, the London Restoration is absolutely fabulous. If you love churches and architecture and the beauty and the history, then uh, all of you have read it, I'm assuming before uh, signing in tonight, but you're, you've seen from the book how much Rachel is passionate about, about churches. And as she said earlier, as we were chatting, um, she is a bit of a romantic, so there's a love story in this, in this book. So, and there's a lot of intrigue and we get into World War II. But the neat thing is that this book is based on Rachel's grandfather's story. And I know I couldn't do it justice. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Rachel to tonight's Islington Reads of the first of 2021. So Rachel, uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. And I'm gonna hand over the Zoom stage to you. Thank you. unmute myself. Am I unmuted? Yay! <laughs> oh, Zoom. Um, so thank you very much for having me. Yeah, I, I live in Toronto. I'm actually in the Forest Hill area, not too far from Casa Loma. So that's where I am in the world. Um, and I attend a beautiful old church, Timothy Eaton, which is a historical church here in Toronto. Um, but I, I'm really excited to talk about the London Restoration. Um, as uh, was mentioned, I kind of started my, my author career. Nobody was buying my historical romances, um, but they were looking for historical mysteries. And so my agent said, can you try something out? So I did. Um, and I wrote many historical mysteries before I finally got the chance with Harper Collins to say, listen, can I finally publish some historical romance? And so I got to do that. And the London Restoration is kind of a heart book of mine uh, because of the churches and because, um, yes, uh, Brent Somerville in the story is a stretcher bearer. My opa was a stretcher bearer for the Canadian forces from uh, throughout the war. Um, he ended up part of the liberation of Holland and married my Oma, my grandmother, and brought her back as a war bride. So I kind of wanted to honor Brent or honor my Opa through Brent and the com camaraderie he has with the other stretcher bearers. And just the idea that, you know, I, I didn't quite base Brent's PTSD completely on my Opa, but I do remember that my grandfather 
used to, he, he's since passed away, but um, when we would go to the fireworks, they used to set him off. The sound would take him back to the war. And then another huge thing that I gave to Brent is my grandfather went the entire war without ever firing a gun. And the reason he wanted to carry men was so he didn't have to carry a firearm. And I thought that was really interesting. So I give that to Brent. Um, and I did read a lot of interviews with soldiers in World War II and a lot of articles that just talked to what life was like after the war, because I really wanted that to be something that was singular. We read so many World War II books, but I kind of wanted to start my love story um, at the moment where the film credits would usually roll. So you're getting some in, it's kind of, I, I would say London Restoration is the first in a duology. I have a companion book coming out called The Mozart Code in August. And you don't have to read one to read the other, but um, the heroine of The Mozart Code is Sophia Huntington Villiers, um, who is Diana's friend at Bletchley Park. And uh, it's also the story of Simon Barr, uh, who's Diana's kind of MI6 contact. So uh, instead of Wren churches, you're going to get lots of Mozart, and it's set in Vienna and Prague just as the Iron Curtain is about to fall. So it does have some of the Bletchley Park flashbacks. It does have a lot about Mozart and some architecture, um, but another love stories. So I thought I would just, <laughs> you know, answer any questions you have. Um, even if you wanted to put them in the chat, I didn't know if you had some questions already. I think some of you had fed some in. So, uh, but that's, that's me. Ask me, <laughs> ask me anything. Um, I'm really excited with how many people are in this Zoom event. Uh, and I really hope you liked the London Restoration and Really, I just wanted to tell a story about two people who find that their love story is stronger because they've withstood something so amazing. And I thought that the churches and the idea that they were the first things that were rebuilt after the Blitz has such a wonderful thematic resonance. So hopefully you, uh, you liked learning a little bit about Christopher Wren. <laughs> Well, it's really interesting because I had no desire or inkling to write a World War II era story at all. When I got this idea, I was still working with um, my Van Buren and DeLuca series, which is set in 1930s Boston. I wasn't really sure what I was going to do next historically, um, but I was actually on vacation in London and uh, a few years ago. And I had been to the city before. I studied in England in university for a little bit. And I ended up going to some of the churches and some of the old historical sites I hadn't seen on a previous trip. And so I went in to see St. Bartholomew the Great, which is the church not that far from St. Paul's. I had never been inside. I had, didn't know a lot about it, but I heard it's one of the oldest churches and I'm such a history nerd. I thought I'll go in. And the moment I walked in this church, which is almost a thousand years old. It withstood the Zeppelins of World War I. It missed the bombs of World War II. It's withstood Henry VIII when he, um, he had the dissolution of the monasteries when you know he was making sure that every church, that the Protestant Reformation, I was just so amazed. And I walked into that church and it was just like a wall overcame and me and I, thought oh my gosh Rachel you have to write about these churches you have to write about London's churches they're such a huge part of the history of this city so on that same trip vacation gone I took my notebook I went to other churches and the more I learned about the blitz and the more I learned that the same number of churches that were blitzed in World War II were the same number of churches that were burned in the great fire I thought this is just amazing I kind of figured that not a lot of publishers would take a very long historical tome on Christopher Wren's era. That's just not what people are buying right now. Um, but I thought, wow, it's really incredible 
what I can find in World War II. And so I knew it was a popular, I'm a literary agent, as was said. So I kind of keep an eye on trends. I knew World War II was popular and I knew that I had to write about these churches. So the churches, I always say that Great St. Bart's chose me. And once I was in that church, I had that idea. Then I first met Brent Somerville. He just kind of walked up to me and introduced me. He was a ginger. I've never had a redheaded hero before. I was like, okay, Brent, I'm running with this. Um, <laughs> and that's kind of how it happened. So once I had the churches and my passion for them in place, I was able to start the World War II research and I was luckily able to go back to London, oh, back when we could travel, um, a year later, um, just to research the churches and spend time at Bletchley Park. And I just went to like 37 churches. Not all the churches ended up in the book, sadly. I'll just have to write another book just about churches. <laughs> One of the things that I really wanted to do, and as a historical fiction writer, I realize I'm never going to have a doctoral degree in all of the things I write about. And so often readers will write with some error or you were off by this much. And I always try to tell people that historical fiction is a gateway into the past. I can't know everything, but I knew that I needed to, for Diana to be authentic, know as much about architecture as I could. So I read four biographies on Christopher Wren, big, heavy tomes. I spent a lot of time at the Toronto Reference Library, back when we could go and sit in libraries, um, because up on, I think it's the eighth floor, they have so many of Wren's blueprints, facsimiles of the blueprints of St. Paul's, of, uh, you know, uh, Magnus the Martyr, um, you know, St. Bride, so many of the churches that I mentioned in the novel. So I really kind of did a crash course for weeks just on learning about architecture so that when Diana is talking about it, that's her passion. Um, there would be an authenticity to her voice and what she knows about the churches. So that was one thing I did. Another thing I did, and I do this with all my books, I've written a series set in Toronto in the Edwardian era, I've written 1930s Boston, and again in London, is that I recognize that the city that I'm writing look, and that I'm visiting and trying to capture on the page looks different now than it did when Brett and Diana lived there. There's still a lot of very similar areas, but it had just been bombed. And of course, urban planning, things change. So I did go, again, Toronto Reference Library. I'm so lucky to live in Toronto as a historical novelist. I went and I looked at maps of the blitzed communities and what street names changed and how the layout of the city changed. And I cross-referenced that with my trips to London, my writing of the description of the neighborhoods that Brent and Diana know. Um, another thing I did is I happened to have a friend who recreates Enigma machines uh, from Bletchley Park. He's very uh, passionate. He's, you know, he, that's kind of his hobby. So I've got a Bletchley Park expert friend of mine. He's also the technical director at the Canadian Opera Company. He's a really cool guy. I know cool people. Um, and he really gave me the technical stuff from Bletchley. I don't have a logical mind. I'm not a code breaker, but just being able to walk through how the day-to-day -day life of Simon and Diana, of Fisher and Sophie would look when they were there was huge. And as I said before, I read a lot of firsthand accounts about what London was like for people uh, who were living during the Blitz there, but also what it was like on the front and a lot about the PTSD. And then the final thing is I had to learn about the Soviet influence and threat. Um, you know, the, the present story in London Restoration is just at the cusp of the Cold War, which was a very serious thing that, you know, shadowed many decades after and definitely shows up again in the Mozart Code. So that was another, uh, there was a lot of reading, a lot of maps, and a lot of studying architecture. And I enjoy the research most of all. So that it was fun, but it was a lot of work. <laughs> well, the first time I walked into St. Bart's, that 
fateful trip when I knew that I had to write churches, it was the verse that just came to mind. It like the powers of hell will not prevail against it. That, you know, obviously the verse speaks to in, in the Bible, we are the church, right? Uh, Peter, you know, on this rock, I will build my church. It's not, it's not as literal as the actual constructions, but the construction of God's house on earth is such a wonderful theme for resilience and for the amazing way that it, it you know, I, I'm just always moved by how the first thing that was rebuilt was the churches because it was so important. Just like um, if you go to Sydney, Nova Scotia, I'm, I'm a church geek. Okay. <laughs> so if you go to Sydney, you'll see a church down by the sea and the people who immigrated from Scotland to Nova Scotia knew they probably wouldn't ever be going back. So they used every part of their ship to start building a church and you can see the planks you can see the nails it was the first thing people and settlers did because it grounded their community in worship in god in their faith but also because churches are the hub of a community it is where people go for solace it's where people go nowadays for food banks for book clubs. Um, <laughs> it is the heart of a community. And I think that that is why that verse is so amazing to me. You know, at another point, Diana loves churches because they become the compass. She can always look for the steeple and know where she's going because the steeple is the highest point on the main street in any English village. Up until the 60s, St. Paul's was the highest point in the London skyline. So even though it's a more literal translation of, <laughs> you know, if we go scripturally there, it's more, you know, we are the church, God, we are God's house on earth and we are uh, integral to carrying on the faith in that way. Um, it is wonderful that we have these beautiful buildings that people lived their entire life building not knowing they would ever see the end of their construction. So I've always thought that that is such an amazing, uh, an amazing symbol for the Christian walk and for the Christian life uh, is that you never really see the end product of what you're doing here on earth. So the powers of hell could not withstand. Um, I just thought that was such an amazing verse. And I, I should, uh, you know, I'm a Christian. I'm a person of faith that every book I write, whether the faith element, like in London Restoration, is seen through the churches or there's no overt faith element, there's always a scripture verse I'm thinking about. Um, and that's just part of my inspiration as a writer. So. It's funny. So I grew up as a, my dad's a pastor. He's now a chaplain for the RCMP. And I remember his sermons. He would always talk. Uh, he loved C.S. Lewis. He still loves C.S. Lewis. And Lewis had written about the Greek forms of love. And he would often quote that. And when I was trying to come up with Brett and Diana's relationship, I wanted it to be a deeper kind of romance. I wanted it like the churches to symbolize something that would hopefully mean something to people beyond just like boy meets girl, girl meets boy, they fall in love. These two had to represent an entire generation of people who had to meet and learn to fall in love with each other again and again after the war, which again has an amazing faith element to me. I just it's so symbolic. And so I wanted to give it a deeper meaning than the usual just guy and girl fall in love. And I thought that the Greek forms of love not only work really well into Brent's profession, because he speaks Greek and Hebrew as a New Testament professor, but it also shows that love happens in so many different forms that are not just the Hallmark Christmas movie, um, Hallmark Christmas nut, but <laughs> uh, form of love, but something that their relationship will only work if it's not just based on their physical reunion or they they kind of have to learn how to rebuild again and so I thought that that was a lens in which I could ground their love in something that was action-based was 
showing about selflessness, friendship, all the different ways that their relationship was stronger than something that was so flimsy, it could easily be torn apart. So I, I did enjoy just in the romantic in me just loved writing that too. Oh, Brent. <laughs> That's a really good question. I think that question's smarter than I am. Uh, one of the things <laughs> that I did was try to show that they are tested, that they are imperfect people. They do have spats. Little things about each other annoy them. Their love is not perfect. And if they didn't decide, you know, this is another uh, scriptural thing. I always thinking about Paul and how you're supposed to die to yourself daily. That's the Christian walk. They have to choose every day to fall in love with each other again after the war because they're completely different people now. But it was interesting you say Eros and Le Le I'm not even try and say it I'm not French <laughs> but one of the things that was very important for me to do from the beginning and you have no idea how many readers are frustrated by this and I get messages about it all the time is when Brent comes back from the war and they spend their wedding night in separate rooms I just didn't think that that was where they needed to start their relationship which is what all the readers want because you know <laughs> they've been apart for four years you want the sweeping kiss you want the romance you want the physical connection Diane is frustrated out of her mind but I really thought that that was a way that he was sacrificing for her and I think because he was willing to wait and he four years the guy's been at the front he's married to this beautiful woman and he's like uh, uh, so he's frustrated and I used that as a way to show that if you can show that you're willing to work through something I think that you can achieve I, I mean I'm a hopeless romantic but I think you can achieve uh, all the different kinds of love in a relationship it's just gonna look different for everybody but for Brent and Diana, obviously they're broken people. They're imperfect people. When you read Mozart code, oh my gosh, those guys are imperfect people too. But it's when they're together that the things, they complement each other so well that I think that they make that possible. But I was very conscious in making sure that they didn't always meet eye to eye. And I was making sure that I wasn't writing a 21st century hero in to 1947 norms. Brent is very much a product of his environment as a British academic male in the time period. Some readers think he has very backward views. I tend to think he's a little progressive. He really wants Diana to get an education because that's what she always wanted before she went to war. Um, but that was, you know, I, I try to show their imperfections, but they're able to achieve their perfect love story only when they work through it together. So that's such a good question. Thank okay. you for that. <laughs> I think it's amazing that that was one of the things that really struck me because we we have this idea we've seen so many films that show those uh the people in the subway tracks the tube stations we have so many pictures of it but what you know brent has to pay the fare to get he puts in their tokens so they can get down to track level the city really couldn't do anything about it they tried but once the blitz really hit london in 1940 i mean what were you gonna do now there is a tragic tragic story about a subway station after the harshest of the london bombing had stopped the air raid sirens accidentally went off people crammed into the subway to get down to the tube level because they still had this reactive instinctive need to protect themselves. And there was such a, a young woman and a baby tripped and there was such a domino effect that people died of suffocation at that tube station. And there's still a little plaque and it just shows that 
even though it wasn't sanctioned, it became such a part of how the community was able to band together and how they were able to defy sanctioned rules because what else were they supposed to do? It was uh, definitely something that they needed for survival. But I think that like in most things, the city just kind of had to give up. What, what are you gonna do? Like, <laughs> there's no yeah. home, <laughs> there's nowhere else to go. But yeah, whoever asked that, I, I loved learning about that because I, I had no idea about that either. Um, and it's, it's funny because when I first got the idea for Brent and Diana, one of the first things I had in my mind was these two have to spend their wedding night at a tube station underground <laughs> because it just, it takes you out of the romance, right? This romantic sweeping wedding night and like, oh, there they are getting their sweaters and their thermoses ready to go down underground. So I kind of made some of that up, but it was actually from my friend, Mike, who's really into Bletchley Park research, that what we decided was that there were people who would just sit and listen to radio waves, these women at Bletchley Park over their earphones to try and get German air transmissions. And I thought it quite likely because classical music would be played all over the place that they would intercept these classical uh, programs in the evening. I wanted to use music because I use music in all of my books. I actually, um, I started, this is such a tangent, but I was actually going, <laughs> I started my university career studying opera. Like I was going to be an opera singer and my parents paid for all these voice lessons and I love music, but I love books more, <laughs> you know, as a career. And so it's my way of making sure that I'm always using all of that musical training and just always fostering my passion. But I also wanted to use Mozart in London Restoration as a kind of setup for Sophie and Simon's story because Mozart plays a much more integral role in that. And I thought I'd give readers a few little uh, nuggets to hopefully entice them. Um, I made up the codes. I am not... You know, I, I, I'm a historical romance writer. I am not one of the brilliant, if you read um, Kate Quinn, you know, she has a book coming out called The Rose Code. It's coming out in a few months. It's fantastic. I read an early copy. She wrote Alice Network. She has a mind that can just, you feel like you're breaking the codes. I don't have that mind. <laughs> so I did my best, but I really was inspired by the fact that these women would listen to radio signals. And I thought that's a really cool, different aspect to Bletchley Park. And it allows me to play with uh, Mozart a little bit, which is something I always, always like to do. They've been doing amazing services during the lockdown. Mm -hmm. Actually, one of the times I was there for research, um, the guy who was on, they always have an on-site historic a historian and I was in there and he kind of asked what are you doing and I was like oh I'm you know writing a book uh and he said I grew up in Cabbage Town so he was a Torontonian who now <laughs> is at uh, St. Saint, Bar Bartholomew the Great which I just think is awesome oh that's really neat um I would say the faith like I am very much a uh, faith and uh trying to write some kind of faith worldview into my books is definitely a product of my upbringing um, because it's such a part of the world I grew up in. But I, I'm also someone who very much believes that you, it's easy for a preacher's kid for it to just be tradition. So it wasn't until I moved away from home and started going to church on my own where I was like, okay, this is not just my parents. This is who I am. Um, I think that my parents instilled in me a really strong, hopefully, uh, moral code. Not only that, I, they're two very different people. They've been married 47 years. Um, they dated for six weeks and just knew the other was the one. And I think that it works even though they're so different because they have a very common value system. And as a single woman who writes romance, in this case with a married couple, I thought that is a really interesting way to make sure that you have a solid grounding for a relationship. So that upbringing where 
they both view, even if, you know, Brent and Diana, Brent's a Christian, Diana doesn't really have that same faith grounding, but they do see their personal morals and value systems in a very strong way uh, and a similar way. So I would say that that's something. Um, but again, like I, I just can't go to a city without roaming into a church. Um, I can't help but listen to Mozart and or Bach or Beethoven and hear the cathedral in it. Um, you know, music and worship are so intertwined. So I would say that that's some of the ways, but I, I view the world through the lens of my background. Um, Great. <laughs> Well, as I said, I always wanted to write historical romance, but nobody was buying it for a while. Mm -hmm. And I am a firm believer that you have to go where the doors open if you want to be traditionally published by a publisher. So I just threw in as much romance as I could. Um, but again, that also set up my ability to write about um, historical time periods and cities and places that I love. Um, so, and I, I read a lot I read a lot and I read a lot of mystery. So the idea of uh, characters, getting to know characters, my first series is um, set in Edwardian era Toronto. There's six stories about a female Sherlock Holmes and her Watson. And just the idea that I could use the mystery element to go into everything from um, Toronto had a morality squad that could arrest women on the streets uh, to you know, a Mountie who's chasing his cousin in Chicago during Roosevelt's speech at the convention. Like it really opens a world. And that was a genre that allowed me to do that. Um, I also do write some contemporary romances set in Vienna, um, the three quarter time series. And it's basically just me writing about my favorite city and people who fall in love there. So <laughs> just lots of romance. And I love writing cities that I'm passionate about and can add some uh, historical stuff to. So I, I think that it's definitely anytime I can research or find out something interesting or something singular or a different angle that people might not have recognized or thought of before, that is what I think is the most fun thing about historical. So. <laughs> So yes, Diana and Brent are around. They are secondary though. Um, here's the deal with me. If I let Diana and Brent be on page too long, they'll take over the scene because I miss them. It's funny as a writer, I spend so much time with these characters. I mean, Sophie and Simon have been my lockdown buddies. I haven't really seen anybody because <laughs> we're in a global pandemic, right? And for so we can't really see our family and friends to a large extent. So Sophie and Simon and I are together all the time. Um, and readers read a book and for the most part move on, but I'm with these characters forever. Um, and so I have to be careful to not let Brent and Diana get too in the way, partly because I want people who are picking up the Mozart code not to feel that they have to to have read London Restoration. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, HarperCollins signed me for London Restoration and two other books. So at that point, they didn't really have to have, you know, finalized stories in, the, in this particular contract. And I was writing London Restoration and initially Simon was a, just a plot piece I needed somehow I needed someone to tie in Diana's Bletchley Park work with what she'd be doing in London that keeps her from Brent but there's a scene I was writing where Simon and Diana sit down at the Savoy for tea and this isn't a spoiler because it's actually if you go to Amazon or chapters and you look at the back cover copy for Mozart Code you see it Simon sits down and I immediately had an entire backstory for this character. It just, I was like, oh my gosh, he's a Lord. He's Lord Simon Barrington of Camden Estate in a, like I had an entire Downton Abbey background for this guy. And then it became tough because you see Simon through Diana's point of view. So you don't see a lot of who he is. And a lot of it, Simon's choices and the way he treats her 
are justified in Mozart code when you learn about who he is and his background. But in London Restoration, you just get little tidbits about him. And so that can make him a very frustrating character. So I had his entire backstory. I had created Sophie as a female friend for Diana at Bletchley, but then I put the two of them in a room together, Simon and Sophie, and somehow I was just typing and they shared a cigarette. I was like, oh, <laughs> these guys have something. And then it became so much fun. Um, so, so you get, I, and then I told my editor, I was like, I, I think I got to do Sophie and Simon and it's going to be like the Alice network meets Downton Abbey. Um, <laughs> and so you get to see a bit of their history, but, and you do get to see Brent and Diana because at the end of London restoration, they are in Vienna, which is where Sophie and Simon are. Um, but one of the things that I explore with Simon that will be very different for people is like Brent and Diana, after the war, people were using civilians and people who were not trained in order to do espionage stuff. So Simon, as you see in London Restoration, isn't always very good at his job. And I didn't want him to be the perfect John Le Carre spy who just knows everything. And I think that that is something that sets Mozart code apart because you have somebody who's supposed to be amazing because all the films we see, all the cloak and dagger, he should be this great, amazing spy. And he's just like, what am I doing? Uh, so <laughs> and that makes me more comfortable because I'd be a terrible spy. Um, that's a great question. So thank you. <laughs> he, he's an interesting guy. I, he's also very handsome. And you don't get that as much from Diana's point of view because she's in love with Brent. But it has been fun to write a very suave looking uh, suave looking hero <laughs> no but we've had some interest there's uh in the world of publishing there's this big binder i call in my head it looks like a binder where they'll call up my agent and say can we file this as being um available and so it is listed as available at different places um yeah so <laughs> Maybe someday. So I have written as a hobby since I was a little kid. Um, I've always said I'm, I'm first and foremost a reader who likes to scribble. So reading is my first love, but I've always written, but I was always too afraid to show anyone my fiction. So I did go to U of T for, um, for English. And then I went to Ryerson to get a publishing degree. And I worked in educational publishing for Nelson Education and was writing in the evenings and then finally got up the courage. It was about six years ago. I had written a lot by this point, but I never showed anyone. And I thought it's about time to see if you can do something with this. So I queried an agent and I got an agent. And then three years ago, I was able to leave my full-time job at Nelson um, and write. I do some nonfiction. I've written a book about Hallmark Christmas movies, one about traveling solo. And then being a literary agent allows me to get into, um, you know, uh, I have a few things going on at the same time, which uh, allows me to be able to write um, as most of my living. Um, and I would say that the pandemic has made it really hard because I think I suffer last year from a lot of COVID brain. Like I would sit at my desk and just wonder why the words weren't coming. Um, so I tend to write best in the afternoon. So I tend to do my agent work and my email and my administration stuff in the morning. And then often I'll work really late into the evening depending on where in the story I am. Um, but for the first several months before I start a book, it's all about the research and usually research trips back in the pre-COVID times um, and time at the library and stuff like that. It's really interesting because when you, I, I love the geeky stuff about the behind the scenes of publishing. Um, I get a questionnaire that's about 10 pages and I have to write everything about the book for the cover designer. So any, um, 
you know, huge moments, any uh, distinctive characteristics, um, other book covers that I really love. One of the things I never want is for a book to show the entirety of a heroine's face because I um, like the readers to be able to imagine. One of the things I said about London Restoration is there are so many historical novels where the woman is turned away from the camera. Like we see the back of her silhouette and she's looking over the Eiffel Tower or she's looking over St. Paul's. It's, it's a huge kind of um, motif in historical fiction right now. I wanted Diana facing us, but I thought that the red hat, I, I said, can she have some kind of hat? And it's kind of covering half of her face that gives you a bit of an enigma, but she's still turned towards the camera. Um, so then we get a lot of mock-ups of possible covers. And there was one that I really loved that had St. Paul's in it. But I realized that that's something Rachel would love. Like I could just put that up in my apartment and be happy. <laughs> we needed to reach readers. And I, I do think that the, um, for both, so uh, if you go to my website or you Google, you can see the cover for Mozart Code, which is also, it's gorgeous. It's so gorgeous. Um, uh, clearly the team at HarperCollins <laughs> knows that I have a bit of a penchant for wearing red lipstick. So both of them have red lipstick because uh, it's kind of my trademark. But I, I agree that it's quite, it's so striking. And I really loved that in a, uh, genre where so many of the uh, covers have dark palettes that, you know, the fact that I, I have it here, just in case I need to look and remind myself of this book, um, that the, the sun is rising, right? Like there is some hope even in the cover of the story, but it comes a lot from me filling out what always seems like an endless questionnaire who do they look like? What are they doing? What are the kinds of things that she'd wear? That kind of thing. And then lots of different cover ideas. And as soon as I saw this one, my editor was like, this has to be it. And I agreed. It just, it suits the book so well. It's quite, it's quite stunning. Um, I love Vienna and Prague. That was our last trip before, like our last big trip before oh. the lockdown or I guess our last, we went on a river cruise. So we were in Vienna and then Prague before. So I'm really anxious to <laughs> read your Mozart code now. You've got me hooked. But just how much have, time have you spent in both of those places? Like, did you spend a lot of time in both of those places to? Yeah, um, Vienna is a very, very special city to me. And it's actually, um, everyone grows up and they say that they want to go to, you know, PEI for Avonlea or to Narnia. Um, when I was in, when I was 10 years old, I read a uh, Christian fiction book called Vienna Prelude by Bodie and Brock Taney um, from my church library. And it's set in Vienna just before the Second World War. And as soon as I read that book, Vienna became my dream city. So I have been several times now. Um, I do write my three quarter time series, which is set there. But uh, I did do a specific research trip and I had been to Prague before a few Christmases ago just for fun. I just thought I'll go for a week to see the Christmas markets. Um, but last November, so just, I get, yeah, just before the plague, um, <laughs> I, I went specifically for uh, research for Mozart Code. And one of the things that I do on these trips is it's where I do a lot of my descriptive writing. So I'll sit, even if it's not, if, even if I haven't written a lot of the story yet, I'll sit down somewhere with a notebook and describe the churches or write out what it would look like to be walking on this street. I, and then I put that into the, uh, the novels later. Um, and part of the reason I like to do this is because I really want to give readers the sense that if they can't travel there, like all of us right now, um, at least they can feel <laughs> like they're seeing it and hopefully immersed in it. Um, but I, I do love Prague. It's got such an interesting history to it. And Mozart has close ties to both of those cities. So it worked really well when Mozart, he's kind of the Christopher Wren of Mozart code. Um, he, uh, 
he spent time in both of those cities so I could tie them together. Um, and Prague kind of becomes Sophie's world and Vienna is very much Simon's. So they have a, you know, they've got a bit of a, they've got some hurdles to cross in their relationship. And I wanted to give them both a distinctive city, um, but those two cities are close together. So yeah, Vienna, I just love Vienna. I wish it was there now. I wish I was anywhere now. No offense. Well, I hope you watched A Christmas in Vienna on the Hallmark movie. I did. I was actually in Vienna when they started to film that. So I was very excited because it's like my two favorite thing is Hallmark Christmas movies and Vienna together. That was a lot of fun. Uh, something as small as sharing a cigarette can create a whole story for you. Or Simon was a side character and he sat down at a table and all of a sudden you knew him. You just knew the character, you knew the story. Um, does that happen for all your characters? Do you start writing with the little idea and then it just explodes as you're writing or do you tend to look at the whole structure of a story and develop the characters before getting into the writing? I would say for my lead characters, I know them immediately. They introduce themselves to me. So Brent walked up to me in Great St. Bart's and then part of it is because I do always have romance, you're finding the complimentary partner for that person. Um, but often a, a perfect example of this was in my first series, Herringford and Watts, my uh, Watson character, Jem, uh, she falls in love with a muckraking reporter from a fictional paper in Toronto called the Hogtown Herald. And he was just supposed to be a side character, but the first time those guys were on stage, they had, it's almost like what you would see in a chemistry screen test if you're in film. I was just like, they have a love story here. So I would say that often I, I know that I have to hit certain points with characters, but usually I type to their dictation. Now the side characters like Fisher Karn or um, in Mozart Code, uh, Simon's supervisor is Marcus Brighton. Some of the secondary characters, that's not as that's not as necessary, but often they just kind of show up and introduce themselves. And I think a perfect example of this is I sometimes make my family and friends watch the uh, Dan Stevens movie, Man Who Invented Christmas where Dickens, like Scrooge, just walks into his office. I'm like, that is exactly what my life looks like a lot of the time. <laughs> so yeah, it's, but as an artist, you would see that, right? I mean, in wedding dresses, those, those little details are often what make something so amazing. And if we focus on the little things, that can be the most interesting. You know, I didn't want to tell a sweeping war story I could start with just two people who are finding each other and happen to like churches and happen to have different histories. And uh, it's that shared love that kind of, I was able to build a world around. So I'm kind of lucky that way. I don't have to, uh, <laughs> in most cases, I don't have to wrangle them too hard to introduce themselves to me. If I can add on one thing, yeah. when you're, then when it comes to the dialogue for the characters, does it just because the characters are so unique and how they speak, does that just come to you? Or is that something you kind of have to mine a little bit to create separate speech patterns? And, or do, are they just so present for you that they speak as you're writing? It's kind of a hybrid because my editors make sure that the dialogue drives the story, but I do hear every character's distinctive voice in my head. Like I get, Brent has a, I, I don't think there are enough romantic heroes where the author tells you they have a beautiful speaking voice. Brent has a great deep voice and it's because I could hear it in my head. So I was like, Diana would definitely notice that this is a good looking, or this is an attractive trait. Um, oh, this is a good question just from the side. Uh, do the names of the characters have significance? Um, it's so interesting. So I kind of, um, Diana and Sophie are the heroines in a series I love called Pat, uh, by Patrick O'Brien, the Aubrey and Maturin series based on man of war and ships in England. And I just love them. But I learned uh, once I had those uh, names that St. Paul's was built on uh, where a statue of Diana the goddess used to be. And I was like, that's amazing. Um, Brent, when I was 18, 
the first Tony Award winner I ever saw on stage was at the Stratford Festival and it starred Brent Carver, who sadly passed away the week before London Restoration came out. So he didn't get to know his namesake, but I always wanted to name a character Brent after Brent Carver because I'm a theater nut. But then I learned that Brent means from the burnt place. And I thought that that is such a cool uh, reference to the blitz and all that was happening in the destruction and the fire of London. So I thought that was cool. Um, and Simon is because of the whole Peter and the rock on this rock, I will build the church. Simon, of course, called Peter from the Bible. So that's where Simon got his name. So I, I do spend a lot of time. Um, and I do give little nods. The surname Somerville is from a book called The Morning Gift by Eva Ibbotson, which is one of my personal favorites. So I just thought I'd you know, dig out that surname and some readers catch it and they're like, is that from Morning Gift, that surname? And I'm like, yes, yes it is. <laughs> oh, Rachel, thanks for being with us tonight and for giving us an hour. Um, I hope people watch that Dickens movie and picture you in it. I think <laughs> <laughs> coming. That was one of my favorite movies this Christmas season. So, um, and it made me want to read more Dickens. So I think the gift is when we have the privilege of meeting an author and hearing about their life and their work. Um, we hold your stories differently than we did before tonight. So Aww. I'm deeply grateful. Um, I read the Vienna Prelude and used it for my independent study in grade 11, like reading these Christian novels. And I never met anybody else who loved them, but I still have them <laughs> in my office at work. Oh so God. that made me um, just have just a joy of connection. Um, and the way that you helped us see and remember in this time in our life that there's still a soundtrack for all of our stories and that classical music can weave that thread through. And um, often many of us that are here tonight can close our eyes and picture ourselves listening to music in our home church of Islington in a sacred space that means a lot to us that we can't be in uh, right now. And on Sunday, um, I didn't get to preach on your novel. Sometimes there's there's a chance where it overlaps, but the song uh, that our staff singer sang on Sunday was There is a Balm in Gilead. And that, um, that kind of is the soundtrack when we think of the healing in the relationship that you wrote about it in this book. And, and we'll see how that plays out in the for Sophie and Simon. Um, I just want to say thank you for being with us tonight and for all of you who are here for, for the, the reading that is sustaining us and helping us be resilient through this time and the chance to be together. And um, the Islington Reads team has been a joy as they bring their love and debate about which books we should choose. Um, but steadily, Sarah has been for us um, a, a bright spot uh, in, in gift giving through the Christmas season. We know she's in the midst of year end at the bookshop and she's had some um, well-loved staff members retire in this last little while. So our, our prayers and support continue to be with Sarah and deep gratitude for us introducing, uh, for us being introduced to you tonight, Rachel. So I just wanted to say thanks on behalf of all of us. I'm sure there's going to be some more words of gratitude on the chat. Um, but I do want to offer a book lover's prayer to all of us uh, as we go into this night. Let the pages be ever turning. Let the words run on and on. May our eyes be ever reading and our imagination ever strong. Let our mind remain wide and open to the discoveries within. May we never lose this passion for a story to begin. May the stories, they be plentiful. May we find our cozy nooks to ever read and carry on the love of good books. And for this night, I bless you all. And we're going to take a break from Lent. So, you know, there's this great library with 66 books in it called the Bible that you may be invited to, to, to dabble into over the Lenten journey to Easter. Um, there'll be amazing devotions written by our community that will be up every uh, day through the season of Lent after you have your pancakes on Pancake Tuesday. Um, and then stay tuned for the Easter surprise of what our next book will be. We can't wait uh, to see what will come. But for now, Rachel, bless you. Keep writing. And for all of you, be well. We'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.
and everybody find me online if you have any more questions i as yeah. sarah mentioned i'm everywhere uh facebook twitter instagram and i'm always sharing what i'm reading but uh i'm happy to talk more so thank you so much great thank, thank you. you take care